This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. On Money Talks, we discuss money news and take your questions about personal finance. For 15 years, we've provided free financial information for Mississippians. I hope you can join me, Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson co-host of Money Talks, Tuesdays at 9 a.m. or anytime on our podcast. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. I hope your weekend was a great one uh, and, uh, you know, excited for Thanksgiving soon. It's hard to believe. But uh, today we're really thrilled to learn from Representative-elect Justice uh, R. Gibbs II about his work as a lawyer and why he chose to go into public service. I know you and I talk about if you want to change the law, you know, run for office. And he has. And uh, it's just good morning. It's, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit about your background and, and uh, you know, why you decided to go into law? Yeah, well, first, thank you all so much for inviting me uh, to the show in legal terms. And uh, it's so great to be here. As I was saying, I've always uh, listened in, and, and you guys have some pretty impressive guests. Uh, so it's great to be a part. Uh, but yes, my name is Justice Gibbs, and I am a native of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, where I was born and raised here. I went through the Jackson Public School District. Woohoo! Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Murrah Mustang. And um, after that, I attended Howard University, where I earned my bachelor's in political science. Um, and went straight to uh, law school at the University of Mississippi. Uh, and so now I do practice law at a Gibbs Travis law firm, uh, where we're now a full service firm. Um, but I primarily uh, focused on civil defense, civil litigation, uh, premises liability matters, uh, as well as a pro bono work, as well as assisting people in their legal questions that I get each and every day. Um, but you know, to answer your question about, you know, why I decided uh, to enter into public service, you know, I saw a void in this state of a lack of young voices and young participation in um, elected government. And, you know, I really always wanted to find a way to imp uh, affect and improve voter apathy here, as well as connect to young people um, when people always ask us to go vote and exercise our right to vote and we need young people and this is a huge block of folks that we need at the polls, yet young people here in this state don't see folks that look like them or represent them in these elected offices. And um, I've d done some research about what I've seen in other states and other states that have younger participation in elected government tend to see a trend, a spike in young people going to exercise their right to vote because they feel seen. And I wanted to unlock that door here in the state. And so that's partially why I decided to run at this time. I think it's great. And I think, you know, the thing about young people is they have a longer term stake in everything that happens than somebody like me, you know, who um, has a shorter term stake in things. And so really, I think they they need to exercise their right to, to, to so that things can be the way they want them to be for their future, because that's really important. So I'm so glad you said that about young voters. Um, you know, you're a lawyer and you, you practice full time. So that's a full time job. And you basically just got elected to another job that certainly, uh, while it's not necessarily full time, it's going to take a lot of time. So why do you think lawyers, why do you think it's important for lawyers to consider running for elected office? We, we definitely need individuals who understand the law, how law is created, and the, even the specifics in the wording of certain laws, certain statutes, and how big of an effect it has on people. Um, you know, the legislature is where laws are created. You think about the House Committees, Judiciary A, Judiciary B. Uh, there's a reason why uh, normally, attorneys who are elected receive preference to serve on these committees because this is this is where it happens. This is ground zero for affecting uh, how our laws uh, affect people. Uh, and so I just think attorneys, uh, but also folks that are in, within criminal justice, administration of justice, 
those folks are really needed in um, in places like the legislature because uh, they can offer s- some added expertise in how laws are created. And, it, and it, you're, you're so right. I mean, one, one of the things I was talking about in class this morning is statutory interpretation and reading a statute. And, and yet we have people drafting statutes who have never gone through uh, training, uh, like, uh, like a law school training, as, as you have. Um, so um, now, but, all right, so we need more. I think we, you and I would both agree we need more lawyers in legislation, legislature and uh, in, in government in general uh, for that reason. What do you think is the reason we don't have more lawyers in the Mississippi legislature? Well, you know, <laughs> that's a good question. I would I would first say that I hope that that trend is uh, is is reversing itself. Um, I do believe one that all professions should should be represented in the legislature because just like attorneys can bring a level of expertise, teachers can bring a level of expertise, engineers can bring a level of expertise, scientists, uh, the list goes on, and nurse practitioners. Uh, but we are still seeing a, a, a positive trend of attorneys. Uh, being elected. So even um, younger than myself, Mr. Fondren, who is, uh, will be, I believe, the youngest legislator in the uh, Mississippi legislature, he's an attorney as well. So the the two youngest members will be attorneys, which is good. Uh, and but, but I think, again, it's about finding uh, the right people to run and the uh, people to understand that they're constituencies need them. Uh, we need quality candidates statewide, all over. And, um, you know, attorneys should consider, you know, entering public service as long as they understand the right intentions of doing so. I think there also be- needs to be more mamas uh, in uh, ma- mamas and, and daddies who put being a daddy as a, as a priority in, in service also. But then, it's a good, but good then point. someone I mean, would expect me to run too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it's public service, not self service, that we're talking about. That's right. Yeah, you know, That's you know right. it's interesting. I talked. I was talking to an older uh, lawyer who was a part of the legislature in South Carolina when I lived there, and I asked him why there why lawyers you don't see as many lawyers running for office, and he said, for him, it was when they changed the rules that allowed lawyers to advertise that he stopped running for office. And I thought, I said, what are you even talking about? I said, well, it used to be the only way you could advertise was to run for office. And so a lot of lawyers ran for office for that reason. Now, because the Supreme Court has said lawyers can advertise years ago, you don't see as many lawyers feeling the need to run for office. I thought that was kind of Wow, that is interesting. That is very interesting. Cynical, but interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and I want to disclose to our listening audience, uh, Justice's name is Gibbs, G-I-B-B-S. My child, his last name was Gill, G-I-L-L, and was in Justice's class. So we, uh, we, ha- we have a, a long history together, and I, I've known Justice for a while and uh, even knew uh, early on that great things would, uh, were in store for him. So I'm super excited to have him on the show today. You can send us your questions to our email address. That's legalterms at mpbonline.org. This is In Legal Terms. Now, not everybody has a chance to listen to our show live. So if you've missed any of the program, you can listen to the whole show from our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Okay, so if you are interested in being a Mississippi state senator, you got to be a qualified elector of the state four years. And Professor Gershon, I guess that just means you've been registered to vote or eligible to vote. What? Maybe we'll get into that, what a qualified elector is. You have to be at least 25 to be a senator and an actual resident of the district or territory represented for two years before the election. To be elected a Mississippi state representative, you must be a qualified elector and a resident citizen of the state for four years. 
at least 21 years old. So, yeah, there was a lot of cushion for justice. Um, A resident of the district represented for two years before the election. Now, that information and requirements for all the other elected offices can be found on our Secretary of State's website. I'll have that link in our podcast information. And I know for a fact that uh, resident of the district for two years, that tripped up some folks because they got fact checked on that, Mm -hmm. at least in the in the metro area Mm -hmm. on the recent elections. We are talking about running for state office with somebody who did attorney Justice Gibbs, the second. Now, do you use the second the month? I mean, your dad's in law. So do you use the second a lot? You have to. Sometimes I do. Yeah. But I, I added on there. Yeah, just to, just since it's there, sometimes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, we do have a call. Let's go to Jackson. It is Charles. Charles, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Well, good, good morning to you, you all. I, I heard the conversation about the types of skills that would be good in the le- legislature. <clears throat> I think, you know, I always think that all laws that are passed affect someone, how a person can participate or not not participate in the uh, in the uh, wealth wealth distribution. So I'll be thinking about people that understand finance would be a great addition to uh, individuals in the legislature. And I have nothing against um, attorneys, but sometimes I think attorneys make things so complicated so they can. It, it, it provides an opportunity for them to earn money uh, late, 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 uh, later on. I've given it, you an example. You know, when a person wants to find out information about their property, when you go downtown, you have to go through so many steps to, to get to it, to get to the final number as far as what the address is. So many, they, they, sometimes the individual people of the everyday, everyday person, they won't do it because it's so complicated. You know, an example would be that if you want to find property to have it by a street address would make it a lot simpler than having to go to uh, the legal parcel uh, description. However, I do think someone that understands finance good would be more would be would be helpful in uh, in the legislature so that uh, they can explain to everybody the economic benefit or detriment of, of a law to everybody that's that's being affected. So with that, I'm going to shut up and listen. Thank you, Charles. We appreciate you calling in. And I will personally send an email to Dr. uh, Dr. Nancy Lottridge Anderson and Ryder Taff, our Money Talks financial advisors. I'll kind of get their gauge on their running for office. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, Charles raised a great point. I do think, yeah, those kinds of, first of all, financial literacy is something we all should have. Um, and it would be great to have. And people in the legislature definitely need it when they're passing tax laws or repealing tax laws um, because they have financial impact on on people. Uh, the grocery tax is a good one to think about. I mean, it, it certainly has a financial impact on people. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a great point he raises. Um, and, you know, uh, you, you mentioned uh, qualified electors. Yeah. What, what's quickly. that about? I mean, you have to be a citizen of the state okay. for that time period. Mm-hmm. So that would that would not preclude someone who was in college who was in another state, but still registered to vote in Mississippi because they would be treated as a citizen of the state, is my understanding. Um, right. and Justice, if you if you know differently, please tell us because you probably have a greater uh, understanding of this than I do. No, you're you're on point with that. That those are the the three main requirements. And then remember, uh, also it's important for if you're an independent candidate to have enough of of signatures that you would submit to the Secretary of State. Uh, Now, with independent candidates, there's not a fee associated with being able to qualify for the ballot, but if you were going to run uh, under a specific party, then you would have to uh, pay a filing fee with the party, uh, and there is a deadline for that. Uh, So that's something that uh, everyone who ran for office this year for for a state legislature and the state senate had to make sure that that was in 
um, and, and, and you'll be approved through the party as well. Um, but also, you're correct, uh, Professor Charles raised a great, great point about um, their, the need to make sure that there are more folks who understand finance in the legislature. Again, we're talking about billions of dollars in our state budget, and it's the legislature's responsibility to allocate those, those funds. You know, we look at the Appropriations Committee, you know, what those select individuals have to go through each and every year to make sure that uh, state legislative districts have the f- the funding that they need to carry out their local projects to make sure that our state agency is adequately funded. Um, and, and he's absolutely right. There's a need to have someone who has expertise in finance, as well as a whole host of other uh, professions, because, you know, a lot of times, especially with, with your colleagues in the legislature, when you develop trust with people, you you understand and respect their level of expertise even more. And it, it helps you make decisions quicker and uh, responsible decisions. So I would echo that. I think it's really important. And, um, and you know, well, now you have been in public service justice for really, it seems like your whole life based on your background and even before you went to law school and became a lawyer. So, you know, tell us how your education and faith played a role in your decision to, to be of community service. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I'll say that it first started with having a strong community, strong role models, strong parents, um, but not just my parents, but, you know, my pastor, uh, my principals. I just ran into one of my principals, Dr. Moore, who was assistant principal at Chestane Middle School. I was at a legislative uh, breakfast for Jackson Public Schools and ran right into him and had to tell him how big of an impact he had on me believing in myself and developing the confidence to be able to run for office, but also the confidence to stand up for your community. That's something that a lot of constituents in 72 was looking for in their next representative. Will you be able to have uh, the backbone to be able to represent us on certain issues that may be, um, may be difficult uh, with with what the majority thinks or believes, but that is your job as a representative is to represent the people and to keep their interests at the forefront of what you do. So I will say that, you know, my education again it, it taught me the the specifics of of, of government, of course. Um, you know, I, I often credit Howard University for giving me. Um, the education and the background of political science, but also, again, the School of Law at Ole Miss for teaching me things such as legislation. I took legislation with uh, Professor Hall. There was a whole host of other um, classes that really prepared me for this moment. But I would say more than anything, it's just being in the community and understanding the people uh, that I, the, the area that I was born and raised in, understanding what their issues are and understanding where the majority of the constituents want to see Mississippi go. And uh, if you always remember that, then you'll be successful uh, in, in advocating for their needs. We do have a question, and we'll see if uh, our guest Representative Justice Gibbs, newly elected to the Mississippi House, can help answer it. It's from Natchez. It's our caller, Andrew. Andrew, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Yes, ma'am. I just had a couple of quick comments. Uh, One thing is the whole thing with the state ballot initiative. It seems like the reason they don't want to do it is because the legislators don't want the people to have more of an input. And like in matches, the voters voted down a, a tax to pay for a new school. The school board overrode it a few years ago. And I was just wondering how that can happen. It's sort of like, what's the point of us having a vote if it's not going to could be overridden? And the other comment I had was as far as like gerrymandering, like for the state representative, we used to have a Republican but now we have Benny Thompson, and it's like you don't really have a choice who you can vote for because essentially it's it's almost like fixed that there's going to be one Democrat and the rest Republicans in, in, the, in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. And it almost like just perpetuates the whole black-white thing, you know. And it's just I just feel like it's, it's really bad. I understand why they do it because of the history of voter issues, but... I think it's really time to get over it and let us decide, you know, who we like to vote for. And uh, I'll just hang up and listen. I enjoy your show. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andrew. Well, that was a lot to unpack. Um, you know, the ballot initiative, if we think we're going to get that or not, uh, having legislative people overturn the will of the people and also, I guess, safe seats for uh, incumbents. Uh, Justice, what would you like to tell you? Anything yeah, you want to respond? Yeah. Any comments about I, either any of those? Absolutely. Well, first, we must restore the ballot initiative. I mean, it is um, over a technicality. Um, in my opinion, it's not only embarrassing to our state, but 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 the way in which people look at our state. Um, the, pe- the will of the people is very important. And the reason why there are certain laws that are passed today is because of the evidence that the elected officials were able to see with con- the, with their own constituents going and voting for a particular issue. And, and that's why, again, the ballot initiative is so important. Even if certain things fail with the ballot initiative, it still creates momentum for certain bills to get through the legislature because it's the voters speaking directly to the representatives saying, hey, this is a statewide issue and this is what 300,000 people think about it. And so, it, you know, that's something that must happen immediately in this new in this new session, and I will be honest. I was a little bit frustrated that the ballot initiative was not brought up as a main topic uh, with our gubernatorial candidates. I think that's one of the first things that should be on the that should be a top priority because um, it, it does so much to bring people into the process. Even if it's just a specific issue, it brings people to the polls. It allows them to to exercise the right to vote and other issues. Um, it's just good all around for, for a state like Mississippi. So I would echo what he's saying about that. I think that's important. When that's you, really such a good, go ahead. you go know, ahead, you were, t- you had mentioned, uh, Professor Gershon, the, um, benefits possibly of having a- attorneys as legislators. Do you think, I, I don't know anything about the, uh, Natchez school board, but, uh, I- I'm, I'm wondering, if uh, I don't know if elected officials know better sometimes than a, on a specific issue and then 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 voters if a voters vote something down how you know how can that be uh, revived or whatever by electors is, either of you want to comment about that? Liz, I think you know part of it is um, you know, uh, it depends on the way we look at it. I mean, we elect people like Justice to represent us, and he has that vote, so that's one vote. And so, you know, the legislature as a whole makes decisions, and we we respect those decisions because they are elected officials. But with the ballot initiative, it gives us the opportunity to put things in front of them that, uh, you know, that if a majority or however the initiative comes back, the super majority of the voters want it, um, then that's something that should happen because that's saying we, we the legislature hasn't acted on this issue. So now we're going to take it in our hands because we want this very strongly. And that happened with originally with medical marijuana, of course, mm-hmm. as Justice pointed out. Mm-hmm. I agree. It was a, a technicality that probably could have easily been fixed. Could have been fixed by the legislature for years if they had wanted to, to fix that problem. So that's my take on it, and I'll defer to justice on on this as well. Yeah, I I just want to emphasize the effects of even a failed vote on uh, with the ballot initiative because again, it just it creates momentum. That's one of the things that legislators are tasked with during debate is to really raise why not only their specific legislative district is affected by the, the the passing of a bill, but how other legislative districts are affected positively or negatively by passing a bill or by an amendment. And so, again, when when you see that that there is a, a, a large amount of Mississippians supporting a specific issue, because, again, legislators and elected officials have blind spots. And it goes back to what he was stating about the Natchez School Board District. This is why it's so important to have accountability measures. Are those elected officials or school board members having um, town halls? Are they publicly accessible? Are they able to explain to you why they took a certain vote when maybe the majority of their community thinks otherwise? Because there sometimes are reasons um, that that the public may not be understanding of or exposed to that that is why they want to vote for a specific thing, but they have to explain that. And when that's not explained, that's where the disconnect happens. 
the frustration. You can email us your questions. Our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gerson is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill, and we do hope you'll subscribe to our podcast. You can also find all the MPB Think Radio recordings on our website, mpbonline.org slash radio. So if you're re- interested in running for public office as a member of the Republican Party, you'll need to learn about them. You can do that at their website, msgop.org. And according to their website, you can learn about the party and the platform. You can shop for their merch and view their events calendar. We are talking today about becoming an elected official with newly elected House member from District 72, Justice Gibbs. We've got a phone call from Gloucester. It's Vivian who's called in. Uh, What is your comment or question? Welcome to In Legal Terms. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to know, can a person with a criminal record run for office? Justice, did they ask you? If you'd been convicted of anything? Well, <laughs> no. And, and I, what, what my understanding is, is if you're eligible to vote, uh, then you're able to hold elected office. Um, now, of course, you know, that is an issue that has actually been taken up uh, by the, uh, I believe, the uh, Fifth Circuit in regards to those who have lost their right to vote and whether or not they will be able to restore their right to vote. I don't believe those individuals are able to run for office. Uh, Professor Gershon, you have any comment on that? No, I agree with you. It says qualified elector, so somebody who can vote um, in every office in Mississippi. That's what you have to be as a qualified elector. So as long as you can vote, you should be able to run for office, even if the person has been convicted of a crime. Uh, at the federal level, there's you know there, there are things in the in the federal constitution and federal law that may prohibit someone uh, who is uh, a criminal from running for some offices. So, uh, and I think that'll come up uh, pro- maybe in the 2024 election for for president. That's a possibility, and that's mm-hmm. something that people have been debating and talking about. Constitutional law scholars, I'm not one, mm-hmm. have been talking about. So it's not even clear in that respect. But it does look like qualified electorate. So it, I guess it's up to their constituents if they want to vote for somebody with a uh, criminal record. And it would be up to the opposition party to dig it up if it's not already known. Thank you, Vivian. We appreciate you calling in. We have another call from Ridgeland. Let's go to Bill. Bill, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Yeah, I had a question to um, um Mr. Gibbs, about the influence of lobbyists on legislators um, and what he thinks about um, lobbyists and how they influence legislation. Uh, In particular, I've been trying to get the legislature to change the justice court system to require justice court judges to be lawyers like all the other judges in the mm-hmm. state, mm-hmm. instead of just having a instead of having a high school education, mm-hmm. which is all they have to have now, and the justice court lobby and constable lobby is so strong, they we can't get anything done in the legislature because of their lobbying power. And I just wanted to get your opinion on the effect of lobbyists on legislation. Bill, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thanks for calling in and bringing that up. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I'll tell you, Bill, first of all, I'm glad to hear you're from Ridgeland, Bill, because I, and I hope that you live in southern Ridgeland uh, in <laughs> District 72. Um, but that is a really good um, and, um, you know, complex question that I can unpack. But I will tell you that there are some lobbyists that have a good effect and there are others who have a bad effect or advocate on things uh, that prevent the public in general, the general public from being able to express their opinion and be able to get their opinion through. Uh, whether it's through authored an authored bill and get that bill passed on the floor to head to the Senate uh, or otherwise an amendment that the, the public cares a lot about. Um, what I will say is that there are certain other communities, other groups of people, for instance, nurse practitioners um, who 
it might be better for them to hire someone who has already established relationships with le- legislators who don't live in their area, uh, for instance, whether they're on the Gulf Coast or whether they're in North Mississippi, to be able to advocate on uh, things that they want to see change that may help their profession. I think that lobbying in that sense is okay because it's exposing um, what, what that particular group uh, may want to see done through the legislature. However, there are a lot of other um, issues that arise that that lobbying prevents again the public from being able to uh, get through to what the, they want their legislature legislator to address, and so that's where I think that there is an issue. That's why again, what a legislator's you know responsibility is to host multiple town halls through a legislative session where it's not the lobbyists who have the influence, then it's the people who have the influence and it's the people uh, who host their legislators accountable. Um, And you have to, even as a legislator, you have to use good judgment. You have to know when there's somebody who is um, taking advantage of a situation or trying to take advantage of a particular vote. And you have to, you know, like I said, be able to stand up for your community and what the people are asking you to do. So I will say it's a double edged sword. Oh, Professor Gershon, I'm so I've just gone down a little rabbit hole myself. Hearing about that made me think of the the Eddie Murphy movie, The Distinguished Gentleman, uh, talking about lobbyists influencing elected officials. And it pulled up the uh, the date that movie came out and that came out before anybody here was born but you and me. <laughs> there are very few people who uh, were born um, before me. So. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I, yeah, I think that that it just goes to there's uh, there's good apples and there's bad apples and there's forces for good and there's uh, forces that gum up the works. So we would hope that lobbyists are helpful and but also sometimes that's where the, the money goes. Let's take uh, one more call. Let's go to Gaucher and find out what Steve would like to ask. Steve, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms today. Our, our guest is newly elected House member from District 72, Justice Gibbs, and we're talking about running for office uh, and our legislators. What is your question? Yeah, it's kind of complicated. Well, anyway, good morning. Um, we, our states don't understand a democracy and a federal government is a republic, okay? And which causes us to get a minority president that being less than 50% like in Clinton. Is any movement to have that changed? Because uh, I think uh, we should have a majority president instead of a minority president uh, to change the uh, election procedures or whatever you want to call it. It's kind of hard to explain, but. Uh, it makes things more competitive, I believe, and it won't, it won't be, the country won't be as polarized, I don't think. Is there any movement to change the voting regulations to allow a runoff during federal elections uh, if somebody don't get 50% plus one? Oh, okay. So like uh, uh, electoral college and things. Uh, Justice and right. Professor Gershon, y'all are both studied this kind of thing. What uh, What is your opinion? Anybody? Well, I, well, I do think I, I am one of those people. This is my opinion, not the opinion of MPB. I think the electoral college has far uh, since uh, passed its usefulness. Um, and we have had... Um, many elections where the majority vote did not carry the election. And that gives way too much power, I think, in my opinion, to votes in some states uh, with lower populations. And also, as my daughter said, uh, there are times she feels like, and I feel like in this state, my vote for president doesn't really matter if we know that an election is going to go a certain way and the electoral votes are going to go a certain way. Right. 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 And I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, the Electoral College, while I understand at the you know creation why it was created, I think that you, you need to make revisions when you see that it's not serving uh, the democracy well. And 
I would agree with you. There are, there are a lot of folks, uh, in not only in this state, but even other voters. Uh, for instance, if you live in the state of California and you vote in a particular party, may not feel as though they should exercise their right because they already know where the 55 electoral votes in the state of California is probably going to go to. What does that do? That creates, that contributes towards voter apathy. So again, uh, and it also confuses and, and frustrates a lot of people when, as the caller said, there's someone who has millions of more votes than a competitor and and they lose the election. So, you know, I've always had the opinion that every vote matters. Every vote should count. And, um, you know, unfortunately, and that that is something that would be decided, I believe, on the federal level with the, the United States Senate and, and, you know, the U.S. House of Representatives. And that is a incredibly complex place to get something like that done because, again, you're going to have states like, for instance, Wyoming and Montana. You're going to have smaller states, um, you know, really, really push to to keep this in place because it gives them the ability to allocate their electoral votes to a certain party for a U.S. president. So uh, it's something that uh, that that would definitely be a fight. But again, I do think that we're seeing the trends going towards uh, the popular vote uh, versus the electoral college vote. We can take your questions on our email address, legalterms at mpbonline.org. Thank you for being part of our show in Legal Terms. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show on the MPB Think Radio YouTube channel. It's also available on the MPB Public Media app. And our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. At 11 a.m. Central on Tuesdays, following our over-the-air broadcast, you can hear Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking with Dr. Susan Buttress on MPB Think Radio. So if you are interested in aligning with the Democratic Party of the state of Mississippi, their website is MississippiDemocrats.org. There you can learn about getting involved and voting. You can contact party officials, and they, too, have a merch store. Everybody's got a merch store. Professor Gershon, we should sell in legal terms merch. We're, we're missing out. We are talking with newly elected District 72 Representative Justice Gibbs. And it's great having Justice here, Liz. I mean, uh, this is, uh, we have so many questions we we're going to ask him about his public service, but I think I want to jump to, uh, you know, talking about um, your goals and your position as a state representative and, uh, you yeah, and What are some of the challenges facing Mississippi? Yeah. So, again, you know, as I stated, one of my reasons for running is seeing the half a million Mississippians unrepresented ages 18 to 27 who are eligible to vote. And what is it that they want to see done in this state? Um, Number one, what we should be focused on is retaining those who we're educating here. I believe about half of those uh, in our colleges and universities in the state take opportunities outside of Mississippi. I want to want to look at ways and how we can attract and retain uh, young professionals uh, in this state. So the first thing that I'm looking at, of course, deals with workforce development, uh, deals with the code section that establishes the um, uh, Workforce Investment and Development Board, who oversees Accelerate Mississippi, makes a lot of decisions based on the money that we allocate towards workforce development each and every legislative session. I would love to see uh, an individual, a young professional on that board. I would love to see somebody, whether they're a voting or a non-voting member, to have a voice on the decisions that that they are tasked with making uh, to make sure that young people are at the table uh, when we think about these unique concepts and ways in which we can continue to retain uh, folks in this state. And there's some lot of great things that have already been done. Uh, the rural um, physician uh, program that we've seen roll out with workforce development to provide incentives for there to be physicians in areas where um, that there may not be as, as, that what we consider a critical shortage in this state. Right. In terms of health care, um, our career coaching program, making sure that there are folks within the schools that are helping children that are providing them to high sector, high paying industry sector jobs in the state or, or, you know, inspiring them to contribute towards a certain industry 
in this state that will help us grow, that will help our economy grow. Uh, I want to make sure that young professionals are involved in those conversations. Um, if I do, am I, if I'm able to serve on the Workforce Development Committee, I will want to bring young professionals in so that we can hear from them directly. And again, that's really one of my main goals is to continue to find ways to bring in young people and young professionals to the conversations uh, that are happening. As you said, Professor Gershon, it is, it's, it's really us. It's our generation that is going to see how these laws that are being passed are going to be solidified and affecting us and our families when we're in our 40s and our 50s. I believe it's important for us to be involved right now. Also, the issue about voting rights. I would love to see a drive through program for those over the age of 65. I was just at my precinct, and to see those who, who were standing for long periods of time, uh, folks who, who left the polls, of course, there were other issues going on, but just the simple easeability and access to vote, right, while reinforcing, of course, the requirements, the voter ID, all those things, but to make sure that there is access for people to be able to exercise their right to vote. Those are the things that I want to uh, look at as well and to be able to contribute to those conversations. And I'm also a realist. I've done my research. I know that there are bills that have been introduced that have died uh, in committee, but I've also seen bills that have died time and time again. And then there's one session where because that representative have worked so hard, so diligently with their colleagues, they've worked with the House committee chairman, they've worked with the speaker and the speaker pro tem, that bill that, that was dead and that has been resurrected is now going to the floor, is now being debated on the floor. Is that people are now proposing amendments to this bill. So that's what's also important is just to be able to be steadfast in the legislature. Don't give up just because you don't have traction on a particular idea in your first year or your first term. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm committed to uh, pressing on some of these issues that I know affect young people and also those in District 72. That was so well said. I mean, I'm really I'm glad to hear you say that because there, there, there's an uphill battle sometimes when you got a super majority and, you know, and and you're just starting out in the legislature. And I'm glad to hear you're going to not give up and fight. And and, uh, you know, there's some things that happened uh, that that I was surprised happened, honestly. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, our law school has been involved in some reform activities um, in terms of criminal law and criminal justice that we are, I think we're long shots at first. So I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're fighting that fight. Um, what other challenges do you see facing Mississippi and Mississippians in general? Well, I, you know, I will say just very blankly and plainly is Medicaid expansion. Uh, it's something that I'm a big advocate for, not only because of, of what it would do to over 200,000 Mississippians and putting them on health care, but also the, 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 the effects that we sometimes don't think about, the effects of, of economic, develop, <clears throat> economic development. Um, th that's something that, again, we're, there's still a, a, a lot of debate about in this state. Uh, but that's one of the things that I see that other states around us have taken advantage of. You know, Oklahoma, Louisiana, um, they're, 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 and we've seen how it is has worked in those states uh, and the benefits that, that folks in certain areas have, have gotten. Um, that's something that I think is an issue that we need to stay very, very uh, closely focused on, but also public education. Um, public education is very, very important, making sure that we are continually to fully fund our public schools, making sure that there are um, other programs also available, workforce development programs for those um, who are going through the educational track. And again, how do we connect those those bright and intelligent students who will one day be citizens, how do we connect them to the next step in this state? We don't want to continue to lose them. And there's a lot that can be done in that, that set of time. Uh, the legislature can have a lot of effect on, 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 you know, folks staying here. So those are some other goals as well that I think are very, very important. Justice in the, the few minutes we have left, if, if someone were to come up to you and say, gosh, you know, I'm thinking about running for public office, but I don't know, what what would be something that would push them over the threshold to do that? Yeah, well, first I would, it, you know, I would tell them to 
understand the reason why are you wanting to run? What What is your goal? Is your goal to see your community change? Is it your goal to see your community flourish? Are you trying to bring more people to the table? Are there certain issues that you feel like have been ignored for so long, which is propelling you to think about running for office? I would ask them a few of those questions. Um, sometimes it's it's other reasons. It's you know, you have to have finances to run for office. There's so many other barriers that you have uh, to be able to be a viable candidate. And um, I, would, I would talk to them about those things. I would want them to think about everything before they take that step, because it is definitely a commitment that you make. Um, and, and, and again, your days will be long, but there's so much benefit in being able to be a voice for the voiceless, you know. Uh, people who are so busy with their daily lives that they're looking for somebody who can uh, can advocate on their behalf. So they will have to do some thinking, but I will be there to support them on their efforts. And as a former professional volunteer, I would always uh, encourage anybody, if you're interested to to learn a new skill, volunteer there, uh, see if you like it and uh, learn more about it. Justice, I am thrilled that you were able to join us today. You've just made my day, my week, my month. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. That's going to wrap up in legal terms for us. Our team consists of our board engineer and podcast producer, Abram Nanny, and our call screener, Charles Abram, or Charles Arnold. Uh, so for Professor Richard Gerson, who hosts from the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill. I do hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.